Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gradhar Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare It's really time for Krishna book. <laughs> it's really time for Krishna book. This is the summary study of the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam as translated and presented in storybook form by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Fondracharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And this is chapter 31, The Kidnapping of Subhadra and Lord Krishna is Visiting Shrutadeva and Bahulasva. We're getting towards some of the later pastimes here. So, uh, this is chapter 31. And there's only three or four more chapters to go to the end. So, <clears throat> it's chapter 31. Okay, just a brief recap. Chapter 30 was spiritual instructions for Vasudev and the return of the six dead sons of Devaki by Lord Krishna. It's said that those six uh, sons that were killed by Kamsa before the appearance of Krishna were, um, they had offended Lord Brahma. Um, there was a point where Lord Brahma had become sexually agitated in the presence of his own daughter. And the, um, these, I believe they were demigods at the time, they, they found that very amusing and they were kind of ridiculing or making little of Lord Brahma in his difficulty there. And as a result, they committed an offense to a Vaishnav. And uh, so they had to take birth as the sons of Devaki, and then be killed by Kamsa. That, that was their, the reaction they got for that offense. And they were sent to the lower planets, Sutala, where Bali Maharaj resides. You know, Devaki, she asked Krishna to please bring those, those babies so that she could see them because she was feeling so much separation. She had given birth to them and hardly had she been able to even hold them. Kamsa had killed them one by one. So she, she knew Krishna could do that. She asked him if he would. And he did. He brought the six, the six souls back and he presented them before her as babies, six babies. So, and it was an interesting pastime because she offered her breast milk to the babies. They were her babies. But because Krishna had also taken the milk from her, from her breast like that, that when these six other children then took the same milk in the same way from the same breast, they uh, immediately became uh, liberated souls. <laughs> so, returned back home. Back, they were demigods, so they went back to their position as demigods. This is uh, interesting activities there. So this is the chapter 31. The kidnapping of Subhadra and Lord Krishna's visiting Shrutadeva and Bahulasva. So, after hearing of the incident, 
King Parikshit became more inquisitive to hear about Krishna and his pastimes, and thus he inquired from Sukadeva Goswami how his grandmother Subhadra was kidnapped by his grandfather Arjuna at the instigation of Lord Krishna. King Parikshit was very much eager to learn about his grandfather's kidnapping and marriage of his grandmother. Thus, Sukadeva Goswami began to narrate the story as follows. Once upon a time, your grandfather Arjuna, the great hero, was visiting several holy places of pilgrimage, and while he was thus traveling all over, he happened to come to Prabhasa In the Prabhasa he heard the news that Lord Balaram was negotiating the marriage of Subhadra, the daughter of Arjuna's maternal uncle Vasudev. Although her father Vasudev and her brother Krishna were not in agreement with him, Balaram was in favor of marrying Subhadra to Duryodhana. Arjuna, however, desired to gain the hand of Subhadra. As he thought of Subhadra and her beauty, Arjuna became more and more captivated with the idea of marrying her, and with a plan in mind, he dressed himself like a Vaishnava sannyasi, carrying a tridanda in his hand. The Mayavadi sannyasis take one danda, or one rod, whereas Vaishnava sannyasis take three dandas, or three rods. The three rods, or tree danda, indicate a Vaishnava sannyasi vows to render service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead by his body, mind, and words. The system of Tridanda Sannyas has been in existence for a long time, and the Vaishnava Sannyasis are called Tridandis, or sometimes Tridandi Swamis or Tridandi Goswamis. Sannyasis are generally meant to travel all over the country for preaching, but during four months of the rainy season in India, from September through December, they do not travel, but take shelter in one place and remain there without moving. This non-movement of the sannyasi is called Chaturmasya Vrata. When a sannyasi stays in a place for four months, the local inhabitants of that place take advantage of his presence to become spiritually advanced. Arjuna, in the dress of a Tridandi sannyasi, remained in the city of Dwarka for four months, devising a plan whereby he could get Subhadra as his wife. The inhabitants of Dwarka, as well as Lord Balaram, could not recognize the sannyasi to be Arjuna. Therefore, all of them offered their respect and obeisances to the sannyasi, without knowing the actual situation. One day, Lord Balaram invited this particular sannyasi to lunch at his home. Balaramaji very respectfully offered him all kinds of palatable dishes, and the so-called sannyasi was eating sumptuously. While eating at the home of Balaramaji, Arjuna was simply looking over beautiful Subhadra, who was very enchanting even to the great heroes and kings. Out of love for her, Arjuna's eyes brightened, and he began to see her with glittering eyes. Arjuna decided that somehow or other he would achieve Subhadra as his wife. His mind became agitated on account of this strong desire. Arjuna, the grandfather of Maharaj Parikshit, was himself extraordinarily beautiful, and his bodily structure was very much attractive to Subhadra. Subhadra also decided within her mind she would accept only Arjuna as her husband. As a simple girl, she was smiling with great pleasure looking at Arjuna. Thus Arjuna also became more and more attracted by her. In this way, Subhadra dedicated herself to Arjuna, and he resolved to marry her by any means. He then became absorbed 24 hours a day in the thought of how he could get Subhadra as his wife. He was afflicted with the thought of getting Subhadra, and he had not a moment's peace of mind. Once upon a time, Subhadra, seated on a chariot, came out of the palace fort to see the gods in the temple. Arjuna took this opportunity, and with the permission of Vasudev and Kid Devaki, he kidnapped her. After getting on Subhadra's chariot, he prepared himself for a fight. Taking up his bow and holding off with his arrows the soldiers ordered to check him, 
Arjuna took Subhadra away. While Subhadra was being thus kidnapped by Arjuna, her relatives and family members began to cry, but still he took her just as a lion takes his share and departs. When it was disclosed to Lord Balaram that the so-called sannyasi was Arjuna, and he had planned such a device simply to take away Subhadra, and that he had actually taken her, he became very angry, just as the waves of the ocean become agitated on a full moon day. Lord Balaram became greatly disturbed. Lord Krishna was in favor of Arjuna. Therefore, along with other members of the family, he tried to pacify Balaram by falling at his feet, begging him to pardon Arjuna. Lord Balaram was then convinced that Subhadra was attached to Arjuna, and he became pleased to know that she wanted Arjuna as her husband. The matter was settled, and in order to please the newly married couple, Lord Balaram arranged to send a dowry, consisting of an abundance of riches, elephants, chariots, horses, servants, and maidservants. Maharaj Prichit was very anxious to hear more about Krishna, and so after finishing the narration of Arjuna's kidnapping Subhadra, Sukadeva Goswami began to narrate another story as follows. There was a householder Brahmin in the city of Matilla, the capital of the kingdom of Adeha. This Brahmin, whose name was Shutadev, was a great devotee of Lord Krishna. Due to his being fully Krishna conscious and always engaged in the service of the Lord, he was completely peaceful in mind and detached from all material attraction. He was very learned and had no other desire than to be fully situated in Krishna consciousness. Although, in the order of household life, he never took great pains to earn anything for his livelihood. He was satisfied with whatever he could achieve without much endeavor, and somehow or other he lived in that way. Every day he would get necessities of life in just the quantity required, and not more. That was his destiny. The Brahmin had no desire to get more than what he needed, and thus he was peacefully executing regulative principles of a Brahmin's life, as enjoined in the revealed scriptures. Fortunately, the king of Matilla was as good a devotee as the Brahmin. The name of this famous king was Bahulasva. He was very well established in his reputation as a good king, and he was not at all ambitious to extend his kingdom for the sake of sense gratification. As such, both the Brahmin and King Bahulasva remained pure devotees of the Lord in Matilla. Since Lord Krishna was very merciful upon these two devotees, King Bahulasva and the Brahmin Shrutadev, he one day asked his driver Daruka to take his chariot into the capital city of Matilla. Lord Krishna was accompanied by the great sages Narada, Vamadev, Atri, Vyasadev, Parasharam, Asita, Aruna, Brihaspati, Kanva, Maitreya, Chavana, and others. Lord Krishna and the sages were passing through many villages and towns, and everywhere the citizens would receive them with great respect and offer them articles in worship. When the citizens came to see the Lord and all of them assembled together in one place, it seemed that the sun was present along with his various satellite planets. In that journey, Lord Krishna and the sages passed through the kingdoms of Anatar, Danva, Kurujangala, Kanka, Matsya, Panchala, Panchala, Kunti, Madhu, Kikaya, Koshala, and Arna. And thus, all the citizens of these places, both men and women, could see Lord Krishna eye to eye. In this way, they enjoyed celestial happiness with open hearts full of love and affection for the Lord. And when they saw the face of the Lord, it seemed to them they were drinking nectar through their eyes. When they saw Krishna, all the ignorant misconceptions of their lives dissipated. When the Lord passed through the various countries and the people came to visit him, Simply by glancing over them, the Lord would bestow all good fortune upon them and liberate them from all kinds of ignorance. In some places, 
The demigods also would join with the human beings, and their glorification of the Lord would cleanse all directions of all inauspicious things. In this way, Lord Krishna slowly and gradually reached the kingdom of Videha. When the news of the Lord's arrival was received by the citizens, they all felt unlimited happiness and came to welcome him, taking gifts in their hands to offer. As soon as they saw Lord Krishna, their hearts immediately blossomed in transcendental bliss, just as the lotus flower blooms on the rising of the sun. Previously, they had simply heard the names of the great sages, but had never seen them. Now, by the mercy of Lord Krishna, they had the opportunity of seeing both the great sages and the Lord himself. King Bahulasva, as well as the Brahmin Shrutadeva, knowing well that the Lord had come there just to grace them with favor, immediately fell at the Lord's lotus feet and offered their respects. With folded hands, the king and the Brahmin each simultaneously invited Lord Krishna and all the sages to his home. In order to please both of them, Lord Krishna expanded himself into two and went to the houses of each one of them. Yet neither the king nor the Brahmin could understand that the Lord had gone to the house of the other. Both thought that the Lord had gone only to his own house, that he and his companions were present in both houses, although both the Brahmin and the king thought he was present in his house only, is another opulence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This opulence is described in the revealed scriptures as Vaibhava Prakash. Similarly, when Lord Krishna married 16,000 wives, he also expanded himself into 16,000 forms, each one of them as powerful as he himself. Similarly, in Vrindavan, when Brahma stole away Krishna's cows, calves, and coward boys, Krishna expanded himself into many new cows, calves, and coward boys. Bahulasva, the king of Videha, was very intelligent, and was a perfect gentleman. He was astonished that so many sages, along with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, were personally present in his home. He knew perfectly well that the conditioned soul, especially when engaged in worldly affairs, cannot be 100% pure, whereas the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his pure devotees are always transcendental to worldly contamination. Therefore, when he found that the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna and all the great sages were at his home, he was astonished, and he began to thank Lord Krishna for his causeless mercy. Feeling very much obliged and wanting to receive his guests to the best of his capacity, he called for nice chairs and cushions, and Lord Krishna, along with all the sages, sat down very comfortably. At that time, King Bahulasva's mind was very restless, not because of any problems, but because of great ecstasy of love and devotion. His heart was filled with love and affection for the Lord and his associates, and his eyes were filled with tears of ecstasy. He arranged to wash the feet of his divine guests, and after washing them, he and his family members sprinkled the water on their own heads. After this, he offered to the guests nice flower garlands, sandalwood pulp, incense, new garments, ornaments, lamps, cows, and bulls. In a manner just befitting his royal position, he worshipped each one of them in this way. When all had been fed sumptuously and were sitting very comfortably, Bahulasva came before Lord Krishna and caught his lotus feet. He placed them on his lap, and while massaging the feet with his hands, began to speak about the glories of the Lord in a sweet voice. My dear Lord, you are the super soul of all living entities and, as witness within the heart, are cognizant of everyone's activities. As such, being duty-bound, we always think of your lotus feet so that we can remain in a secure position without deviating from your eternal service. As a result of our continuous remembrance of your lotus, your lotus feet, you have kindly visited my place personally to favor me but your causeless mercy. We have heard, my dear Lord, that by your various statements, you confirm your pure devotees to be more dear to you 
than Lord Balaram or your constant servitor, the goddess of fortune. Your devotees are dearer to you than your first son, Lord Brahma, and I'm sure that you have so kindly visited my place in order to prove your divine statement. I cannot imagine how people can be godless and demoniac even after knowing of your causeless mercy and affection for your devotees who are constantly engaged in Krishna consciousness. How can they forget your lotus feet? My dear Lord, it is known to us that you are so kind and liberal that when a person leaves everything just to engage in Krishna consciousness, you sometimes give yourself in exchange for that unalloyed service. You have appeared in the Yadu dynasty to fulfill your mission of reclaiming all conditioned souls rotting in the sinful activities of material existence. And thus, and this appearance is already famous all over the world. My dear Lord, you are the ocean of unlimited mercy, love, and affection. Your transcendental form is full of bliss, knowledge, and eternity. You can attract everyone's heart by your beautiful form as Shama Shundar, Krishna. Your knowledge is unlimited, and to teach all people how to execute devotional service, you have sent your incarnation, Nara Narayan, who is engaged in severe austerities and penances at Bhadarik Ash, Bhadarik Narayan Ashram. Kindly, therefore, accept my humble obeisances at your lotus feet. My dear Lord, I beg to request you and your companions, the great sages and brahmins, to remain at my place so that this family of the famous King Nimi may be sanctified by the dust of your lotus feet at least for a few days. Lord Krishna could not refuse the request of his devotee, and thus he remained there for a few days along with the sages, in order to sanctify the city of Matilla and all its citizens. Meanwhile, the Brahmin, simultaneously receiving Lord Krishna and his associates at his home, became transcendentally overwhelmed with joy. After offering his guest night sitting places, the Brahmin began to dance, throwing his wrap around his body. Shrutadev, being not at all rich, offered only mattresses, wooden planks, straw carpets, etc. to his distinguished guests. Lord Krishna and the sages, but he welcomed them to his best capacity. He began to speak very highly of the Lord and the sages, and he and his wife washed the feet of each of them. After this, he took the water and sprinkled it over all the family, members of his family, and lo, it appeared that the Brahmin was very poor, he was at that time most fortunate. While Shrutadeva was welcoming Lord Krishna and his associates, he simply forgot himself in transcendental love. After welcoming the Lord and his companions, according to his capacity, he brought fruits, incense, scented water, scented clay, tulsi leaves, kusha straw, and lotus flowers. They were not very costly items and could be secured very easily but because they were offered with devotional love, Lord Krishna and his associates accepted them very gladly. The Brahmin's wife cooked very simple foods like rice and dal, and Lord Krishna and his followers were very pleased to accept them because they were Hmm. Yeah, they were not very costly items and could be secured very easily, but because they were offered with devotional love, Lord Krishna and his associates accepted them very gladly. The Brahmin's wife cooked very simple foods like rice and dal, and Lord Krishna and his followers were very pleased to accept them because they were offered in devotional love. When Lord Krishna and his associates were fed in this way, the Brahmin Shrutadev was thinking thus, I am fallen into the deep dark well of household life and am the most unfortunate person. How has it become possible that Lord Krishna, who is the supreme personality of Godhead and his associates, the great sages, 
whose very presence makes a place as sanctified as a pilgrimage site, have agreed to come to my place. While the Brahmin was thinking in this way, the guests finished their lunch and sat back very comfortably. At that time, the Brahmin, Shutadev, and his wife, children, and other relatives appeared there to render service to the distinguished guests. While touching the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, the Brahmin began to speak. My dear Lord, he said, you are the Supreme Person, Purushottama, situated transcendentally to the manifested and unmanifested creation, material creation. The activities of this material world and of the conditioned souls have nothing to do with your position. We can appreciate that it is not only today you have given me your audience. You are associating with all the living entities as Paramatma since the beginning of creation. The statement of the Brahmin is very instructive. It is a fact that the Supreme Lord, Personality of Godhead, in his Paramatma feature, entered the creation of this material world as Mahavishnu, Garbhadakshai Vishnu, and Chirudakshai Vishnu. And in a very friendly attitude, the Lord is sitting along with the conditioned soul in the body. Therefore, every living entity has the Lord with him from the very beginning. But due to his mistaken consciousness of life, the living entity cannot understand this. When his consciousness is, however, changed into Krishna consciousness, he can immediately understand how Krishna is trying to assist the conditioned souls to get out of the material entanglement. Shrutadev continued, My dear Lord, you have entered this material world as if in a sleeping condition. A conditioned soul, while sleeping, creates faults or temporary worlds in his mind. He becomes busy in many illusory activities, sometimes becoming a king, sometimes being murdered, sometimes going to an unknown city, and all these are simply temporary affairs. Similarly, your lordship apparently also, in a sleeping condition, enters this material world to create a temporary manifestation, not for your personal necessities, but for the conditioned soul who wants to imitate your lordship as enjoyer. The conditioned soul's enjoyment in the material world is temporary and illusory, and yet the conditioned soul is by himself unable to create such a temporary situation for his illusory enjoyment. In order to fulfill his desires, Although they are temporary and illusory, you enter into this temporary manifestation and help him. Thus, from the beginning of the conditioned souls entering into the material world, you are his constant companion. When, therefore, the conditioned soul comes in contact with a pure devotee and takes to devotional service, beginning from the process of hearing your transcendental pastimes, glorifying your transcendental activities, worshiping your eternal form in the temple, offering prayers to you, and engaging in discussion to understand your transcendental position, he then gradually becomes freed from the hmm. His heart becomes cleansed of all material dust and gradually become visible in the heart of the devotee. Although you are constantly with the conditioned soul, only when he becomes purified by devotional service do you become revealed to him. Others who are bewildered by fruitive activities, either by Vedic injunctions or customary dealings, and who do not take to devotional service, become captivated by the external happiness of the bodily concept of life. You're not revealed to such persons. Rather, you remain far, far away from them. But for one who, who, being engaged in your devotional service, has purified his heart by constant chanting of your holy name, you become very easily understood 
as his eternal constant companion. It is said that your lordship, sitting in the heart of a devotee, gives him direction by which he can very quickly come back home, back to you. This direction, dictation by you, reveals your existence within the heart of the devotee. Only a devotee can immediately appreciate your, ex your existence within his heart. Whereas for a person who has only a bodily conception of life and is engaged in sense gratification, you always remain covered by the curtain of Yogamaya. Such a person cannot realize that you are very near sitting within his heart. For a devotee, you are appreciated only as ultimate death. Let me read that again. For a non-devotee, you're appreciated only as ultimate death. The difference is like the difference between a cat carrying its kitten in its mouth and cats carrying a rat in his mouth. In the mouth of the cat, the rat feels its death, whereas the kittens in the mouth of the cat feel motherly affection. Similarly, you're present to everyone, but the non-devotee feels you as ultimate cruel death, whereas for a devotee, you are the supreme instructor and philosopher. The atheist, therefore, understands the presence of God as death, but the devotee understands the presence of God always within his heart, takes, dic takes dictation from you, and lives transcendentally, not being affected by the contamination of the material world. You are the supreme controller and superintendent of the material nature's activities. The atheistic class of men simply observe the activities of material nature, but cannot find you as the original background. A devotee, however, can immediately see your hand in every movement of material nature. The curtain of yoga maya cannot cover the eyes of the devotee of your lordship, but it can cover the eyes of the non devotee The non-devotee is unable to see you eye to eye, just as a person whose eyes are interrupted by the covering of a cloud cannot see the sun. Although persons who are flying above the cloud can see the sunshine brilliantly as it is. My dear Lord, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. My dear self-effulgent Lord, I am your eternal servitor. Therefore kindly order me, what can I do for you? The conditioned soul feels the pangs of material contamination as threefold miseries as long as you're not visible to him. As soon as you are visible by development of Krishna consciousness, all miseries of material existence simultaneously become vanquished. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna is naturally very much affectionately inclined to his devotees. When he heard Shrutadeva's prayers of pure devotion, he was very much pleased and immediately caught his hands and began to address him thus, My dear Shrutadeva, all these great sages and saintly persons have been very kind to you by personally coming here to see you. You should consider this opportunity to be a great fortune for you. They're so kind that they are traveling with me, and wherever they go, they immediately make the whole atmosphere as pure as trans transcendence, simply by the touch of the dust of their feet. People are accustomed to go to the temples of God. They also visit holy places of pilgrimage, and after prolonged association with such activities, for many days, by touch and by worship, gradually they become purified. But the influence of great sages and saintly persons is so great that by seeing them, one immediately becomes completely purified. Hmm. 
Moreover, the very purifying potency of pilgrimages or worship of different demigods is also achieved by the grace of saintly persons. A pilgrimage site becomes a holy place because of the presence of the saintly persons there. My dear Shruta Dev, when a person is born as a Brahmin, he immediately becomes the best of all human beings. And if such a Brahmin remains self-satisfied, practices austerities, studies the Vedas, engages in my devotional service, as is the duty of the Brahmin, or in other words, if a Brahmin becomes a Vaishnav, And if such a Brahmin remaining self-satisfied practices austerities, studies the Vedas, engages in my devotional service, as is the duty of the Brahmin, or, in other words, if a Brahmin becomes a Vaishnav, how wonderful is his greatness. My feature of four-handed Narayan is not so pleasing or dear to me as is a Brahmin Vaishnav. Brahmin means one well conversant with Vedic knowledge. A Brahmin in the insignia of is the insignia of perfect knowledge, and I am the full fledged manifestation of all gods. The less intelligent class of men do not understand me as the highest knowledge, nor do they understand the influence of the Brahmin Vaishnav. They are influenced by the three modes of material nature and thus dare to criticize me and my pure devotees. A Brahmin Vaishnav or devotee already on the Brahminical platform can realize me within his heart. And therefore he definitely concludes that the whole cosmic manifestation and its different features are effects of different energies of the Lord. Thus he has a clear conception of the whole material nature and thus Hmm. and the total material energy. And in every action, such a devotee sees me only and nothing else. My dear Shruta Dev, you may therefore accept all these great saintly persons, Brahmins and sages, as my bona fide representatives. By worshipping them faithfully, you will be worshipping me more diligently. I consider worship of my devotees to be better than direct worship of me. If someone attempts to worship me directly without worshiping my devotees, I do not accept such worship, even though it may be presented with great opulence. In this way, both the Brahmin Shrutadev and the king of Matilla, under the direction of the Lord, worshipped both Krishna and his followers, his great sages and saintly Brahmins, on an equal level of spiritual importance. Both Brahmin and king ultimately achieved the same supreme goal of being transferred to the spiritual world. The devotee does not know anyone except Lord Krishna, and Krishna is most affectionate to his devotee. Lord Krishna remained in Matilla, both at the house of the Brahmin Shrutadeva and at the palace of King Bahulaswa. And after favoring them lavishly by his transcendental instructions, he went back to his capital city, Dwarka. The instructions we receive from this incident is that King Bahulaswa and Shrutadev the Brahmin were accepted by the Lord on the same level because both were pure devotees. This is the real qualification for being recognized by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because it has become the fashion of this age to become falsely proud of having taken birth in the family of a Kshatriya or of a Brahmin, we see persons without any qualification other than birth claiming to be a Brahmin or Kshatriya or a Vaishya. But as it is stated in the scriptures, Kalo Sudra Sambhava, in this age of Kali, 
everyone is a sudra. This is because there's no performance of the, ve of the purificatory process. This is because there's no performance of the purificatory processes known as samskaras, which begin from the time of the mother's pregnancy and continue up to the point of the individual's death. No one can be classified as a member of a particular caste, especially a higher caste, Brahmin, Kshatriya, or Vaishya, simply by birthright. If one is not purified by the process of the seed-giving ceremony or Garbhadhan samskara, he is immediately classified amongst the sudras because only the sudras do not undergo this purificatory process. Sex life without the purificatory process of Krishna consciousness is merely the seed giving propensity. Sex life without the purif purificatory process of Krishna consciousness is merely the seed-giving process of the sudras or the animals. But Krishna consciousness is the highest perfection by which everyone can come to the platform of a Vaishnava. This includes having all the qualifications of a Brahmin. The Vaishnavas are trained to become free from the four kinds of sinful activities, illicit sex, indulgence in intoxicants, gambling, no one can be on the Brahminical platform without having these preliminary qualifications and without becoming qualified Brahmin, one cannot become a pure devotee. Let's send the Bhaktivedanta purport of the second volume, 31st chapter of Krishna, the kidnapping of Subhadra and Lord Krishna's visiting Shrutadeva and Bala.